You're listening to Japan Baseball Weekly. News, interviews, analysis, and hot takes about all 12 NPB teams. Hosted by Jim Allen and John E. Gibson. Hi, and welcome to the second Japan Baseball Weekly podcast panel discussion. It's for the week of January 16th. I'm John Gibson, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this broadcast Joining me and my partner, Jim Allen, on a Saturday here in Japan, a Saturday morning. Well, it was morning. It's almost noon now. Uh, a panel of guests, and I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order, just to be fair. Because uh, <laughs> I didn't know which order to go in, guys. That's <laughs> got to be honest. So former Yakult Swallows outfielder and current Swallows International Scout, Aaron Guile from Phoenix, Arizona. Hi, Aaron. Hey, guys. How are you doing? So glad that you could be with us. We're doing well. And former Los Angeles Dodgers GM and geez, you must be busier than an octopus with one tentacle. Uh, this is Dan Evans. Ah. He's, he, he's the executive of a number of baseball entities and businesses and COO of Field of Dreams movie site. And I could go on and on and on all morning. How are you doing, Dan Evans from Denver, Colorado? I'm doing well, John. And thanks to you and Jim for inviting me to be a part of this. And we're thrilled to have you. And then former player, former Nippon Ham skipper, Texas Rangers manager and field manager for the KBO SK Wyverns. And he's joining us from Liberty Hill, Texas, near Austin, is Trey Hillman. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. And thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be with you guys. I appreciate it. Yeah, the honor here. is all ours. Yeah, the honor is all ours. And Jim Allen, who I think most people, you know, he has been in Japan since I'm thinking 1984. I'm trying to guess mm. uh, off and on. And then he, he has been writing about MPV since 1993, I think. And I'm proud to say he has been a friend since we met in 1999 at Nagoya Dome when the Dragons and uh, well, they weren't SoftBank Hawks at that time. They were the Fukuoka Dae Hawks met in the Japan series. So that was 1999. And it has been a real honor and pleasure as we go into year 13 now of the Japan Baseball Weekly Podcast. Uh, welcome to you all, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to have you, all you guys with us today. This is a real treat. Well, so it's always been, a treat, but this is uh, three times <laughs> yeah, three times the the fun here. Well, I told Jim in a, in a text this morning, I said, I've been like a kid all week long, like I was going to Disneyland. I've just been excited about this podcast and to get you all, guys all together and chat about baseball. Quick bio on me. I arrived in Japan in Nagoya, 1990, uh, October. So just at the tail end of that baseball season, uh, I started an English newspaper in Nagoya in 1995. And uh, that led to me having the job now at the Japan News, because when I met Jim, he said, uh, essentially, this guy can can get it done. So let's get him on our newspaper. So uh, he helped me get in on this job. I was born in Wyoming, raised all over the states, but mostly in Southern California. And so I like all the L.A. sports teams. And uh, I think Dan and I are going to be at odds here just because I'm an L.A. Kings fan and he's a Chicago Blackhawks fan. And those teams have really been uh in the past over the past decade at at uh <clears throat> playoff uh combatants <laughs> our our travels john well only in the playoffs That's exactly right only in the playoffs only in the playoffs so uh but on this week's show we're going to really be talking about uh player acquisition um the the whole notion of getting international players and how to assess teams and a lot of things but before we get started we did have Alex Ramirez and Randy Bass, a pair of import players, voted into the Hall of Fame yesterday. And that's so exciting. And I want to say congratulations to both of those gentlemen. And hopefully we can have Rami Chan on the show sometime soon. But uh, just a tremendous accomplishment for both of those guys. And I know Jim was really, uh, in fact, we were talking about before we started going on air, before we went on air here, uh, that you were a little bit surprised about uh, Alex Ramirez being voted in so quickly. I will... Uh, Aaron was. I I was expecting it actually. <laughs> That's well, not I, what you said before we turned on the red light. <laughs> well, I think I, I'm I'm play. thrilled for him, guys. I'm thrilled for him. He's he's been a great ambassador for baseball, and he's been an extraordinary player. It's a, I think it's a really momentous occasion when a when a non Japanese 
goes in. I think he's the third or fourth with Bass. And uh, for someone who is so great off the field and has embraced the Japanese culture, it's a wonderful statement for Alex to go into the Hall of Fame. And he's a dear friend of mine. I love him. So I'm really happy for him. And Aaron, you're a, te- for a past teammate. Yeah, I was a 34-year-old first-year player in Japan, you know, coming over from MLB, and he was my teammate. Um, and he could have... He could have been a little bit jealous, or he could have. There could have been a way that he was trying to make me pay my dues over there. But he was nothing but gracious. The moment I got there, um, him and Adam Riggs were there, and they showed me the ropes. They, they, they showed me how to adapt to Japanese baseball. It was, uh, you know, once once you're part of the family, he really looked out for me and showed me the little tips, pointers, how to be patient, how to adapt to not only the baseball but also the culture and the life outside and embrace it all so that um, if, you know, there was times when I struggled and he helped me keep that balance. And he, be- he was obviously a good friend, but we maintained that friendship. We went other, uh, other places, but um, he was just a great guy and, and man, just so impressed with how he carried himself. But uh, the way that he played the game and how smart he was, it's, it's really no surprise that he was as successful as he was, but, you know, just a really good guy. So I'm super happy for him. Jim? I, I second and third both the opinions already expressed. Rami Chan, for me, um, not only you, you take the physical out, out of it, and, I mean, that was exceptional, especially the power and the OPS factor. Um, but just the way he integrated, and it, it, it goes back to the key thing for me that I think sometimes is missed, And I think Danny can uh, second this, and I'm sure Aaron as well. He's already mentioned it. He he said the word gracious. Gracious goes directly to relational. And I think Rami Chan is exceptional at developing relationships with no agenda, with no agenda whatsoever. Uh, How can I help you was the attitude that I immediately saw him. I didn't know him in the States. I knew who he was, but he was exceptionally he was exceptionally gracious to uh, I know his teammates, but he was also exceptionally gracious to opposing players and to opposing staff. He was exceptionally respectful, which we know how that plays in the Japanese culture. And he just was gracious to everyone that he interacted with to a point where some people, and it happens to my son-in-law. My son-in-law is uh, Brett Phillips, and, and some people here in the United States don't really believe the genuineness of his character. He loves people. He loves the game of baseball. And Tommy John fits right into that uh, with what I believe his foundational intertwining of how he's wired is as a human being. So – I, I just I appreciate that so much because he's got a lot of love in there and I love that about him. Awesome, awesome. Brett Phillips says isn't he going to be with the Angels uh, this coming season? Right? He is. Yeah. He is. I've gotten texts and with my most recent association with my tenth team and my thirty eight year career, uh, it, it, they've got wonderful people there and they they've asked, did you have anything to do with that? And I said, no, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> GM never called me. Manager never called me about my son-in-law. Um, they decided to sign him, so we're thrilled he's with good people. But back to Rami, John, he's just – he's good people. He, he he cares and he loves on people the right way. He does. He does. All right, Jim, I must have misinterpreted what you meant before we started recording. What That's all right. Uh, no, <laughs> I think I think uh, what what uh, what Trey and Dan and, and, and Aaron said is is right on. Uh, so much about what he does plays so well in Japan. You know, and he said yesterday in his press conference, he said his plan, he said, look, my plan was to come to Japan for one or two years, make as much money as I could, and then go back to the States, MLB or the minors, and I'd be set. He said, but <laughs> and John and I know this story. You know, you come for, you, you plan to come for one or two years or three years and things, plans change. Uh, that was my, that was my plan thirty some odd years ago. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> he said, "I fell in love. I fell in love with Japan." 
and Japan fell in love with him. And he's a, and one of the things is that he's such a positive person. And Japan is a, is one of the things about Japan. It just is, is that it's a country that that mistakes are an opportunity for people to take advantage of you. Uh, in in social groups, if you make a mistake, people are gonna use that to move ahead of you in your organization, and so negatives, anything that's slightly negative, they're gonna pounce on it. And he is a master at you know accentuating the positive and eliminating the negative. And I think that and his as Trey said, his ability to reach out to people and to build bridges. Uh. When he was with Oryx, last thing I'll say about when he was with Oryx as a batting consultant one season, um, one executive who was, well, I'll just, I'm not going to say anything bad about anybody today. So one executive said, <laughs> you should come on as a coach here. And he says, no, I want to manage. And he said, no one's going to give a, a guy like you a job to manage. <laughs> And that was about that was about three months before that he signed as the Bay Stars skipper. Wow. So take that. There's another yeah. hit for me, for Rami John. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, no playing softball here. We're going to get started here, and it's hardball all the way. So let's start swinging. Uh, so many of us observers, I think, and I say observers, and I mean fans, people who are not on the field, <laughs> are the observers, um, think that we think about the acquisition of of import players especially when it comes to mpb teams picking up foreign talent that it it works um i guess in different ways from the big leagues but at, at some time in some aspects it works in the same ways as as it does in the big leagues but what are some of the aspects that most of us don't fully comprehend in the procurement of international on-field assets and i want to start with aaron because you are someone who's actively involved in helping to try to get players over here to Japan right now? Well, I think uh, there's so many different parts of it that you have to consider um, to get a player over here. And you'd, like you mentioned earlier, you have numbers that maybe support, you know, a player. Um, however, for me and my experience, there's just so many different factors that come into it. Um, Japanese baseball and, 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 and MLB are, they're a, they're a slightly different game. You know, one's MLB is very dynamic. Uh, Japanese is very clean. Um, so for me, I, I, you know, now as an advisor, when I'm looking at a player to potentially help my club, first of all, we get very specific instructions on what type of player we're looking for, whether it's a position player, a starting pitcher, or maybe a relief pitcher. Um, I put on um, my hat where I'm, I'm looking at so many different factors does the skill set that that player have that may be successful in the States, does that, if I picked him up and put him in Japan, is that going to translate as well? Does his skill set, um, does it, does it go well? And a lot of times, um, you know, as, as, as a relief pitcher looking for velocity, you know, and, and maybe um, uh, the, the skills that certain players have, but we have as a foreign player, you have to be able to do something that a Japanese player can't do or maybe they don't have the ability to do that. And that can be difficult. So it really narrows it, it, it sometimes it makes my job easier because I know that when I go scout a, um, a triple A game or a big league game, I know there's probably only two or three players on an entire field that are going to, that I'm going to look at. So I can look very closely to those players and, and really make um, a determination on whether I think that's going to be a benefit. Um, there's all, so a few different factors, and I'm sure Trey, could, Trey can speak to this, is that for me, I was a very hardworking guy, a very gracious guy. I loved my opportunity in Japan. And so I want to meet that kid as a personality. I want to find out um, his temperament. I want to find out if he's a good teammate. I want to find out if he's going to mesh. Because that that harmony in Japan plays so much better. Um, it's so much more important in Japan than the individuality that we do have in the, in the States. So I want to find somebody that... Is going, because you're only going to have a li very limited amount of foreigners. I want to go find out a guy not only is going to perform in the field, but is going to for for a manager like Trey is going to is going to be someone that's a blessing to him and is going to work really hard on him and, and and really be cohesive with that team because it's it's not like you, where you can just option a kid down to AAA. There's such a process in getting a guy to to go over to the states that 
um, we have to very carefully consider not just the 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 skill set but also the personality so that that that's a good fit because once you go over to Japan um, it's you're you're in it um, you're you know you got to sink or swim and we want to make sure we got a great personality and a humble kid as well. Uh, Trey, I couldn't say it any better than he just said it, Aaron. That that's that's awesome because for me. Uh, the skill set is what it is. And um, with the foreign acquisitions, I had uh, some input, but we had foreign scouts. Uh, Matt Winters has been a foreign scout for <clears throat> fighters for many, many years. And I trusted his judgment. But the part that I would talk to uh, Matty about more than anything else was the second point that Aaron brought up. How are they going to assimilate in the Japanese culture? And that goes back to exactly the same thing that I said about Ramichan. Because if uh, we all know how powerful this is, having been involved uh, in, in different areas and in different degrees to the NPB, if you even attempt to embrace the culture, even if it's incorrect, if the attempt is there, then the acceptance goes up exponentially of respect of, oh, we're going to wrap our arms around you in this culture, and we're going to help you fit into this culture. And my thing with manager, and I listen, I, I preface this with saying I've made thousands of mistakes. I made thousands of mistakes, especially my first year in Japan. But I wanted those foreign guys that would – transform into trying to be as Japanese as they could out of respect of the Japanese culture, which mm -hmm. speaks volumes to not only their teammates, but the acceptance from the public view. Oh, we like this guy. He's trying to learn to speak the language. He's not afraid in Okinawa or wherever spring training is to try uh, delicacies. Mimi guy. I'll never forget. I was put, uh, pig's ears in front of me on a live interview and they were putting stuff in front of me and I tried everything and I almost actually regurgitated <laughs> after I that found wouldn't... out what it was. <clears throat> but, um, you know, just the fact that you would do that out of respect for the culture because they wanted to see what your reaction was to eating something that was cultural, for lack of a better term. So I was always into those guys, and I'll tell you, and this is probably just because of my five years there, but the Latin players seem to assimilate quicker than the uh, American bread players did. And I, I, would, I really started looking at that at year two through five, and I was like, man, that guy gets it. Well, it's just common sense. Those guys had to get it going from their Latino based country to the American culture. And then, so it was like second nature to them. Once they went from the American culture coming from Latino background, Venezuelan, Dominican, Colombian, whatever it was over to Japan. Right. And those were the guys that got close to their teammates. Those were the guys that started trying to learn the Japanese language those were the guys that weren't afraid at the team dinners and the banquets in Okinawa to try anything and try everything just to fit in. And they didn't really want to in most cases, but they did that out of respect. So uh, that was the avenue that I was most interested in because Aaron used the word blessing. We want, we want this guy to be a blessing to whoever he's playing for and his teammates. That's honestly, for me, that's what it's all about because I am so into, I read multiple books. I got on the internet. Thank God the internet was available. I read Japanese history all the way back to the Edo period. I read Bushido. Mm -hmm. I read, read Robert Whiting. You got to have Wa. I read Warren Cromar Cromarty slugging it out in Japan. I watched Mr. Baseball multiple times. I watched The Last Samurai. I did as much study. I tell everybody before I went to Japan, I feel like I was back in college mm -hmm. studying culture. 
because I wanted to be prepared for this venture. And, you know, many people over the years have said, hey, pre preparation leads to good things. Well, I prepared and still miss so many things, but I saw those Latin players grasping it quicker than the American players. But I, I was blessed with just wonderful guys, both Japanese and Gaijing as well. Okay. And Dan, yeah, I know, Dan, it works the same way when you're an American-based team and you're looking at foreign talent. Um, what have you seen through the years? Well, let's be honest, guys. Free agents usually fail or barely make expectations in the real world. You, you elevate expectations so high that they're almost unattainable. So for me, the adaptability of any player in the world going to a new environment is a big deal. Um, for me, it's being comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think for a lot of people, um, they're laced with anxiety. They're laced with a fear of failure, a lack of adaptability. Um, it's not a good fit. So for me, when a, a player a foreign player comes to Japan, um, I, I, I think it's more makeup than it is talent. The mm -hmm. guy comes over and he's immersed in a completely different culture in a failure-based uh, failure sport. And I think it's, it's a real difficult challenge. Um, to me, the guys who excel are guys who have a cultural awareness um, guys that are not only adaptable, but aren't afraid to learn. And as both Aaron and Trey said, try new things. Um, and I think they've got to have a situation where they've, they've got to be inquisitive enough to learn the culture. You know, just let's be honest, batting practice is entirely different in Japan than it is in the States, in North America. So before the game even starts, the game looks, feels, and acts different. And for people who don't have that adaptable strand of DNA, you know, it's hard to be an import um, in any game. I mean, you take a look at a Venezuelan coming over to the States, a Cuban coming over to North America, uh, a Japanese player coming to MLB, and a gaijin in Japan, they all face serious challenges. And I think the bulk of them don't succeed. Jim. Yeah. Um, Trey, when you, you talked about the guys, and one guy I remember, he had a very short career in Japan uh, because of injuries. But uh, I just was so impressed by him. Uh, Jose Macias. Mm-hmm. Uh, he and Fernando Seganol, they, the just the joy they brought to the team, and I thought, wow, these guys have really got it. And of course, I, I, I agreed with you. I thought a long time ago about the same thing about the Latin players. You know, they, um, like Alex Ramirez. He, you know, he was signed in Venezuela. He's a seven, seventeen-year-old. He's, I think, he was sixteen, and they saw the Indians saw him. Because he was hitting, he was a pitcher, but he had they they needed somebody to play the outfield that day, so he played in the outfield. And they said, uh, "We want to sign you." He says, "I'm a pitcher," and they said, "Well, we want you as an outfielder." He says, "Okay, I'm an outfielder." <laughs> and uh, he went to the Dominican Republic for a year or so, and then he was in America, and uh, you know he did did what he could to adjust, and then and he you know went to Japan, and he said it, yesterday it was all about trying things he says he said we say he said looking back on my career we 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 say why before we try too many times we mm -hmm. say why 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 you know and try to get out of it and it's something you don't like and you don't think you're going to like but but you know he said so many times you try it and and you see maybe it works maybe it doesn't but if you don't try it you never know so I, I think that's that's the whole that attitude, like Aaron said, that ability to to embrace. In fact, I talked to all all the, I that's the the key, the common theme with guys who've had some success here 
is embracing not necessarily the culture and you know gail hopkins a dear friend said uh wally onamine the the previous import who was in uh uh, inducted into Japan, Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame, told him, don't try to be Japanese, nobody cares. But that's, you know, that's, you know, don't do it superficially. You know, don't do it, don't act like you're Japanese because nobody cares. But embrace the culture, em embrace the culture, em embrace that what they're doing is important. Take it with serious, you know, take it seriously. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, the guys who come over here now pretty much know the script. The scouts of you know Aaron and and Matt and all the all the other the great scouts that are 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 working that have played in Japan and so not always but they tell the guys you know this is how it is in Japan and thanks mm -hmm. to you guys the guys come over here well pretty much you know they're as prepared as you can make them. And they mm -hmm. come over here, and a lot of them now, because of guys like Alex Ramirez uh, and Aaron paving the way, they come over here with an attitude that they can learn in Japan. They can not only mm -hmm. make money, but they can make themselves better ball players, And some of them become yeah. better people. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. I want to parlay, Johnny, if you don't mind. I want to parlay on something that, that Danny said. Danny, you said adaptability. One of my favorite mm -hmm. military terms is AAO. You know, you got FUBAR and then you got AAO. Well, AAO is adapt, adjust, and overcome. And I've always been, uh, first of all, respectfully, uh, God bless our military people that protect our world. But in Nago, in Okinawa, you know, we were 10 minutes from Camp Schwab, the Marine base. And I didn't know that in my first year. You know, everything was moving so fast. But year two through year five, I developed a day for Camp Schwab at our spring training. And they would come and they would drink all kinds of beer and we'd have their own <laughs> section. Then I'd get them in the hitting tunnels and let them take batting practice and have a baseball workout. But that was one of their favorite things. The mantra of the Marines was AAO, adapt, adjust, and overcome. And you nailed it when you said adaptability and adjustability. And I'm, I'm I know that Aaron can echo that as a scout, not only, but Aaron, I I, I gotta applaud you not only with what you do now, but the fact that you were on the ground in the boots uh in NPB is and and maddie too i love matt i just love matt winters guys that have lived it and now you're getting to scout it and you hone in on two to three guys uh it's it's exceptional what you guys do well i appreciate that trey and that it's um i went over there as a 34 year old first time player so i was just i was very in hindsight very glad that i was a mature player not to say I wasn't that same kid at twenty at uh, twenty four, but I got the opportunity to go over there when I was mature, and I was um, so great the opportunity. Um, but I think with just being humble and just being so appreciative of the culture and the opportunity, and being so excited about that, and then having um, you know a teammate like Alex Ramirez, who's got so much experience. I also had an, an amazing manager, Frutasan who was a longtime catcher, who was patient with me. Uh, um, it, th everything happens for a reason. And so it, there were so many times I felt that I, you know, other than just the long distance and the ocean that separates it, there was a few days where you feel, hey, listen, did I make the right decision? Did I, you know, you've left the comforts of MLB, you've left the comforts of, of the language and all these other things. Is, did I make the right call? And I do, re I do remember being on a plane uh, flying over Alaska the first time and looking at just that distance and, you know, almost not a little bit, almost panic attack saying, what have I done here? But um, luckily, just the way that the swallows are, the way the amazing Japanese culture is, and just, you know, people that have played the way for me, 
I assimilated very quickly. I was, I was, I love the, the culture. And I think because I was older and more mature, it gave me a different perspective. Um, but uh, the timing for me was, was great. So now as a scout, um, I understand what indecision these players might have. Um, and then also great respect for you as a manager, because that's not an easy thing to do as well. But also I take it very seriously. I take a lot of pride in what I do to try to get players that maybe had my mindset or Alex's mindset or other successful foreigners mindset so that we can hand them off to, you know, the managers and really smile and be confident that, that they're going to represent us well, uh, the team well, and, um, and hopefully, you know, it's always my hope that they have a, a long and prosperous, you know, career. Yeah. Jim has a question and, and, and I'm hoping you can hang on to that for just a quick second. And, a long time ago when I was a stringer with the Orange County Register in Southern California, and this goes back to looking at a player's talent and trying to project what that person might do, especially when you're, or that player might do, especially when you're going to have them travel to a different culture. And there was a young basketball player who was tearing it up in, in some league out there in Anaheim. And they said, John, go out there and cover this game. This kid's really good. And so I I went out and it was this guy, this kid, I don't know, 150 pound little kid, little beach surfer looking guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, um, haircut, you know, clean cut looking guy. And I don't know, he wasn't even six feet tall, but he was a point guard and he was putting up double doubles and getting lots of points and assists in games. And I watched him play and I said, well, this guy is not better than these other players. He's just smarter. So when it gets to a different level of play, he's going to realize he he can outsmart these guys all day long. He he just cannot play with them. <laughs> and so when you're looking for players and you have to get a player who can make those adjustments, I, I didn't want to see him beating up or not beating up per se, but just outsmarting your average players. I wanted to see him against high level talent. And what would happen on the court. And so when the playoffs came, I went to cover the kid and he disappeared. He was almost invisible, couldn't shoot the way he had shot, couldn't uh, create plays the way he could create plays before that. So I'm looking when you see a player in another environment, how do you try to project what they're going to do when there's when there are more challenges in front? For instance, you have a power hitter who's really good at hitting fastballs away in a certain zone but uh, those same that same zone when it's an off-speed pitch he doesn't hit it very well and uh, a lot of pitchers are in japan are able to exploit that thing so how do you how do you assess that kind of player when you want to bring them over to japan uh aaron well i think it's um uh, there's there's a lot of faith that has to go in there a lot of trust um but also i think as as we watch players we can see that um, that some of it will translate. From my own perspective, I also know that the Japanese baseball is played a little differently. Japanese pitchers have amazing command. Uh, plus, there's a lot of scouting and, and a lot of intelligence. Um, I think there was a comment earlier, maybe even before we, we started, about the spring training. And I think spring training there's a lot of evaluation. It's not performance, it's evaluation. So I recall my first spring training, I was out there and they were giving me pitches. And I, I thought to myself, I'm ripping these fastballs. I'm having great success only to find out that they're forming information on how they're going to get me out when it actually matters, which, which was a new step for me. So, uh, you know, I think there's a, um, the Japanese pitchers are, uh, are very intelligent to do a lot of research um, but the command is amazing. Although the velocity might be down, the command is, is incredible with multiple pitches. So when I'm watching a player um, and if I see a kid uh, that maybe st strikes out 175 times and hitting 220, I'm gonna, he might have 30 home runs, but I'm going to have a hard time recommending him because I know that that, that, that um, strikeout number is going to go way higher. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the strikeouts are going to be there. So I have to really take it all in consideration but also factor in that um, how the Japanese are going to approach this player. And this is just from an offensive point of view, but I have to take all those factors and when I'm making a decision. And so there's times where I'll recommend a player, but I'll put an asterisk there just 
to to let my bosses know, hey, I really like this player. I, li- I really like his skill set. I think in a perfect world, we're going to really like him. But here's some things to consider. And then at my job, I actually pass that off. And the decision is out of my hands. But I have to put those caveats so that they can review it and see if they agree. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not an exact science. But at some point in time, you do have to go on faith. Faith, yeah. Uh, Dan, what do you see? Well, throughout my career, I love seeing guys when they didn't perform well. I uh, I love seeing players when they struggled because it's a game where you struggle far more than you succeed. And I always hoped that I got a game where the guy had a lot of things go bad. I wanted to see if he brought it into the field or he brought it into the plate. How does he handle his teammates? What's he like with the umpires, with the authority figures? Um, to me, throughout my career, whenever I've scouted somebody, I really went to the ballpark hoping they had one of the worst days of their career. You're, you're, because, you're, the, you're the Grim Reaper. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, John, it's real easy to see a player good and know he's good. But I think it's a real challenge and a real test to see a guy bad and think of it is is it chronic or is this a one-time thing? And how does he handle it? And the big difference for the Japanese game for me is in in North America, the best athlete goes to shortstop or center field. In Japan, in high school, he's placed in the center of the diamond. And as a result, the best athlete on the field controls the ball more times than anybody else. It's such a different concept. But as a result, they do. And, and, you know, Aaron said it. The command at the Japanese um, professional level for pitchers one through five, one through six is elite. And it's elite because they're great athletes. So as a result, you get exploited in the NPB game far more successfully. And they, they force you to change. They force you to react. Whereas in the American game, the North American game, many times they'll veer into their own strengths. But in the Japanese game, they exploit weakness. And until you display that you can alter your game accordingly, you just get annihilated in spots where you can't do it. And frankly, when you only have a few Gaijin players, you've got to know how this player is going to handle it those first two or three weeks of a big struggle and, you know, batting practice in the States in North America, it's easy. You're throwing 78 to 82. Here it is. No breaking balls. You go to Japan, you're seeing lefties and righties throwing full speed. They're pumping you. They're not throwing you cookies right down the middle. A lot of guys have told me I can't hit my way out in batting practice like I can in North America. And for some guys, that's an irreversible climb. They can't do it. Dre, what are you seeing? That's a great point, Dan, as far as the the Japanese exploiting weaknesses. That was, I think that was fake. Yeah, the the only place I've ever hit and run with two strikes was in Japan uh, as a manager. And I did it with uh, Kensuke Tanaka, championship second baseman. Good batter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, guy. It was it was bat the ball, and you knew a split was coming. You know, I, I kid around with people all the time. They ask me, oh, I've been asked so many times, you know, what about Japanese pitchers? I said, well, first of all, first thing about Japanese pitchers is they all come out of the womb when their mother births them with the split grip uh, i mean <laughs> and and um but i echo the sentiments of both guys you know i really don't have a lot to add it's uh but to touch on what both aaron and danny have both eloquently said it's really it, it goes back to character you know you got a skill set and Danny, I love the fact that you look for guys having a bad day because that's perseverance. If you want to take a guy in their 
comfort zone, whether they're Latin or whether they're American, and you saw them in the States, and now Aaron's trying to project whether or not they're going to fit in Japan. Perseverance, man. Are they going to persevere? What are they going to be like on their worst day? Because if they're not going to continue to be a good teammate and a good citizen in that culture of the Japanese culture, and they're not going to they're not going to have the ability and the character to persevere and figure out a way to continue to be a good teammate, continue to represent the organization well, continue to listen to their manager that they can't understand or the thought processes that they don't understand and don't know about, they're not going to fit. It, it's as simple as that. So I love what Danny said about uh, bad days because it all goes back to that key word of perseverance and the guys. And, and you know, what's the simplicity of it and what we do in America is who can repeat, who can, re right. who can repeat the skill. The game is faster. I don't care what anybody says. It's faster at the highest level. So who can repeat at the highest level that takes character to be able to persevere through the negative times of lack of performance to get back to performing even at a abysmal pace of three out of 10 as an offensive player. <laughs> abysmal. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Mm -hmm. Jim, uh, what, did you have anything or did you want to ask your question? I did. Uh, I can't really add to anything. Uh, I'm just, I'm digging this uh, completely. Aaron, I, I did have a question for you because the Swallows are, they're not a unique team, but they're close to unique in, in, in some ways. And as you mentioned, Atsia Furuta, he didn't have great success in results, but he he fit that mold of Swallows managers uh, since Wakamatsu. And uh, even and now, especially with Takatsu Shingo being, uh, Shingo Takatsu, excuse me, of being guys who were, uh, abnormally patient with imports mm -hmm. you know that's really the swallows model they're going to give you guys all the chances you need to fail and how easy and one question is how easy for you is how how much easier does it make your job when you're talking to a guy you like to say this is a team that was built for you because you know the swallows aren't going to offer him you know soft bank money and some guys want that. Some guys go on, you know, this guy, the, the Hawks just paid some guy $6 million for six months or something. And Yakult won't do that. So uh, how much easier does it make your job to say, but this is the place you really want to be? And the other one is I want to ask, because the Swallows have a long tradition of being the best bargain hunters in Japan along with the carp to some degree in terms uh, of getting uh, getting import players getting good import players at you know at a, at value prices you mm -hmm. know getting guys who can perform who who don't have that huge MLB resume that sings out big dollars what did you learn or have you learned anything from Michael Nakamura cuz he was kind of the ninja of that that business for years yeah, uh, great point. There's there's a bunch of different things in there, but I will I'll I'll talk about Michael really quickly. Uh, Michael being my boss, um, not necessarily a baseball background, mm -hmm. just a very uh, humbling, intelligent man. He, he ironically, I met him four years before I even came to Japan. So I met him early two thousands. He scouted, stuck with me, and then ultimately signed me to go to Japan. Um, he made the transition great for me to, to, to go over there and then now he's my boss so it's just great to work with him um uh, and 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 i've just i've learned a lot because we'll sit in the stands and from a baseball perspective he'll come to the states and we'll sit there and watch games i have i'll be talking to him on one level and i'll just you know we're just talking out loud and all of a sudden he'll just interject something that i never even thought about that just you know you wouldn't necessarily expect from a non-baseball guy and so i think it's it's no fluke that he's been um, so lucky with with getting good foreign players over time. He has a, a knack, you know, for doing that. But I also think with the swallows, 
our success is built partially on the draft. It's not a, not about seeking big name free agents, and sometimes not even not even seeking big name and and expensive foreigners. You know, we get we get guys like Alex Ramirez that come in, who's um, who not necessarily reinvents himself, but paves a way for himself. And um, I think we've had really good success uh, with that. And it adds to um, having a culture where I believe with Yakult, there is a smaller market feel. It does feel like a family and it's not fake. It's, it's truly that way. Um, when, you, when you go to the front office, everybody is super gracious there. They, they know you, they greet with a smile. You walk into the clubhouse. It, it, there's such a, um, a welcoming atmosphere there. And regardless of whether you're the star or you're someone that just got called up from Nibun, there's such a welcoming place there. So it is, it's a really neat place to play. We, I, in the five years I was there, um, there were no arguments, there were no fights, uh, which was so refreshing considering, you know, playing in the States um, with attitude personalities there. It was so harmonious. And it was just such a fun place to go every single day. So I think, and I can't speak to other teams cause I, you know, I, I didn't play with any others in Japan. I just know my experiences with your cult, but it's not just one person. Normally you have a general manager and owner and create a culture. It just seems like that culture continues, you know, to carry on and, you know, especially for myself as a first year player, I have a manager in Furuta san. As when you talked about patience, I came over, had an, a great spring training, and then just cratered to start the season and just did horribly. <laughs> um, I, I was wondering, how am I going to get out of this? And, and we had dinner about a month in. And through the interpreter, I asked, you know, why am I still in the lineup? And he looked at me and says, well, your on percentage, your on base percentage is very good. And I believe that you're going to get out of this. And, you know, just wow. his confidence in me to show that it wasn't very long after that, that, that I started to, to come out of it. And I knew I could, but that confidence just wasn't there. And, and he let me know that he wasn't bailing out on me and I needed to, you know, just continue to work. And then as Alex would help me with learning the pitchers and catchers and him showing that confidence in me, you know, slowly I, I came out of that. So it was when you have a manager like that, um, it, it means the differ all the difference. Because we've also seen managers in Japan with quite large egos that don't have the patience. And I really believe that there's been some really quality players that don't fulfill their potential because that manager didn't give them that that opportunity the way I was given. So when I see when I when I see that just you know so appreciative of it so it's um you know everyone's experience is a little bit different and you know with your cult i'm uh, i was just glad when i got the opportunity to come back because i felt like they had given me so much over time and you know i'm just i'm just so blessed that i'm with this group because you know now they have the foresight um they're texting me as we're talking right now asking if i'll come to spring training the day that we get there because we have four new foreigners and they would like me and tony barnett to help them acclimate so i'm like absolutely let's you know let's go and that's just the culture that they build and it's not a forced culture it's just the way they are and it's just they're they're a great organization to work with thank you john okay all right getting back to things now we've been talking about import players and i've noticed something over the past i don't know 10 15 years that there have been more Japanese players who have gone over to the States and become big stars than there have been Western players or Latin players coming into Japan and becoming big stars. And I'm saying this on the heels of Alex Ramirez being voted into the Hall of Fame, but uh, we just haven't had anybody, I suppose maybe Matt Merton, but he really wasn't that popular in terms of his overall popularity. But Tuffy Rhodes was a big star here in Japan and we just haven't I mean Dennis Sarfate was popular put up great numbers but I don't think he reached the popularity of guys like Tuffy Rhodes and how they're revered and how they're remembered and appreciated and why are we not seeing foreign players come to Japan and I don't want to say dominate but have the the kind of stardom that we've seen Japanese players go and experience in the U.S. and I want to start with Dan here. Well, I think part of the, John, it's a fabulous question. We have 30 options as opposed to 12. And I think when you've got 30 chances to give a guy a chance and be, 
become a better player. You know, I think about Paul Canerco. He gets drafted in the first round, struggles with the Dodgers, Dodgers, goes to the Reds, struggles with the Reds. I was able to work a deal for him. Well, you know, there, there's there's 30 places to play. There's a DH in our, you know, in our game um, now on both sides. So as, as a result, fewer players slip through the cracks. I think the scouting is so good um, in North America that somebody's always willing to take a chance on a guy. Um, I, you know, I think with, with a limited number of imports, it's, you know, when teams are making good decisions on their North American players, there's fewer opportunities for guys to come from the States over to NPB than it is for guys to go from one organization to another in North America. Um, and I, I think plus it's really darn hard to succeed in another country. Um, there's a lot of Latin American players that get signed for big bonuses that come to North America and fail because the assimilation is harder than the game. And I think, you know, very candidly, John, I think it's a fabulous question, but I think guys have more chances to fail in North America. And as a result, fewer opportunities because all it takes is a club to believe in you on a waiver claim or whatever. And then you don't get the opportunity to get released and go play over in Japan. You're still in, you know, I always call it the, the pond. You're in the, you're in the 30 team pond and you're swimming from club to club and an NPB club never becomes an option for you. Trey. Uh, the only thing, Danny, I think that's awesome. I, I think you're dead on. The only thing that I will add is a portion of what Danny touched on. For me, it's generational. I, I think it has to do with the millennial. And I'm not trying to dissect and discriminate between different generations. But, hey, look at what's going on in our world. Our world wants to stay more comfortable now, worldwide, than we did even 15, 20 years ago. So I, I think that there are fewer guys, even if there were the opportunity, which Danny eloquently said, there's not as much opportunity because of the variance between 30 and 12 uh, in the NPB. And then I'll take it further, go to the KBO. Uh, with 10, uh, it's, I, I think they want to stay, this generation wants to stay in their comfort zone more so. So if they think that there's opportunity with one of the 30, they would rather take that split contract of a AAA slash major league deal rather than a guaranteed money deal because of the way that the presentation is on one hand from the business side of one of the 30 and their perception of what their comfort zone is and just staying right where they are and making it happen here in the States. So I, and you know, I, Trey, if I could just say, if I could follow up, there's a whole generation of great Japanese players who at seven, eight o'clock in the morning have spent their entire lives watching major league games. Mm-hmm. Um, Ichiro, Matsui, Nomo, there's a whole generation of guys who came over and they watched their stars early in the day. So when they were playing in the afternoon, they'd already seen a game earlier in the day. And I think the game is more anglicized than ever before in Japan. Guys sequence differently. They, they emulate major league players not just NPB players. They see big league guys on TV in the morning, and then they go out on the high school fields or the big six fields, and they emulate a player who's playing 4,000 miles away. And I think that's one of the reasons why guys are coming over to North America and excelling because, you know, I, I was with Ichiro in Seattle, and, 
you know, he didn't know the American players. He didn't know a whole lot about them. These guys grow up and they know all about them. They, you know, they're some of their favorite players. And that for me, this is the first generation of Japanese players who had that mindset. Good insight. Mm -hmm. Aaron, what did what have you seen and what did you see when you were over here playing? And why do you think we haven't seen a, a real foreign star, superstar here in Japan? Well, I think Dan and Trey covered it, you know, great. The only thing I might add to that is is only from my own experience. As a player uh, growing up in Canada and 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 watching games and trying to copy, you know, my stars, my goal and my path up was was to the MLB. Um, so I wasn't aware of that there was Japanese baseball. Even in the minor leagues, I was not aware that there was Japanese baseball or the quality or what opportunities there were there. Were there um, how amazing it was, um, all of those things. It wasn't until I was maybe late 20s when the, when the topic actually came uh, up that I might have an opportunity to go over there. And even then, it was still five years before I went. So there was no awareness that Japan was such a great option. And so I think sometimes, just to add to what everybody's saying, is players are just focused on getting MLB, going to the MLB, that sometimes, unless a player like myself or someone goes and talks with them and presents the idea, sometimes there's a lot of players that I feel are good quality, um, but they just aren't aware that, that that is a direction they can go. Hmm. No. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I've just been looking at that. And, and Jim, what do you think about it? Because I've, I've just well, noticed that. I, I That's a great question. And I think uh, all the things you said are are uh, that Aaron and, and Dan and, and Trey said are right on. And I think there's one other thing is that because of the success, because of the visibility has changed so much from Aaron's point of view. And even Alex Ramirez said, you know, he heard about Japanese baseball because the Swallows and Cleveland Indians at that time had an agreement. And the Swallows players would come from mini camp and the coaches would come and Charlie Manuel was there and he's a former Swallow. And when just before he went to Pittsburgh, Charlie started talking to him. So that was the thing. And Tuffy was a similar case. He basically, the Boston Red Sox acquired him so somebody, because somebody in their front office had a personal deal where he made money off of sending players to Japan. That's right. Who will who will not be named? <laughs> because I'm old and I forget people's names. <laughs> point of it. It's Ray Point okay. of it. Okay, thank you. And <laughs> you say his name to a Boston Red Sox reporter and you get the eye roll. Uh, so, uh, so that was the thing. They were set up for that. You know, these guys were target on, you know, they were being targeted. But now, because of their success, we have a whole new dynamic in Japan, which is the guy, you know, and John and I, and John, you know this, because when you talk to you guys, and we often ask the one question, you know, what is it that brought you to Japan? Because it used to be, well, um, it didn't look like this was going to be my year. So suddenly my agent heard out of the blue, there's a job in Japan. So let's go. Let's try it. But now it's like guys are on a five and six year waiting list to get to Japan. That's right. Um, or they, they just they've long since had a plan and they're able to execute it at the at the right time. Sure. Sure. It's a case of the right time. It's a case of their contract. It's a case of their options in America, uh, whether their team is going to let them go. Uh, but Japanese teams are in touch with these guys. They know the scouts are talking to them. They know, you know, there's a deal and it almost happened. The guys know, and they all on the other, the flip side of that is they know they can come to Japan. And because these quality guys, because the, it's four players now and as many players as they want on the roster, unlike it used to be mm -hmm. two back mm -hmm. in the day of Randy Bass, that there are opportunities and guys come and they get better. And the, the flip side of that is the MLB scouts who used to be looking, spending all their time looking at Japanese guys are now spending 80% of their time looking at the former North American guys 
who are developing here in Japan. And so yeah. now we've got, and, and some of them aren't former ML, Robert, Robert Suarez with the Padres and Chris Martin and Nick Martinez and, and uh, Scott McGuff. And the scouts are all saying, you know, and they're asking me which, which import players are out of con are going to be out of contract this year. You know, mm -hmm. that's what they want because now it, you, you know, when uh, Miles, uh, Michaelis came to the Giants, he said he had a, he and another former Rangers teammate. And, and Nick Martinez said the same thing when he came. And he said, What's your plan? He says, uh, Yeah, the money was good, but I want to learn things. I want to learn things mm -hmm. that'll, that'll put me back in a, you know, put me back in a guaranteed contract in MLB. A lot of guys said that in the past, but it was a mix. It was a 50 50 thing. It was a if. And then the Japanese teams were saying, well, we're going to give you, we'll give you $2 million next year. And their chance in MLB was a, a camp tryout. They're right. saying, well, or, or a one, you know, a minor league contract. They're going to say, well, I'm going to stay in MLB because A, I'm, ha I'm loving it. I'm going to stay in Japan because I'm loving it and they're giving me a bigger contract. But now that there's that parity between opportunities to go back to Japan that did not exist uh, 10, 15 years ago. Tuffy and Alex both said they had lots of options. Dennis are thought they had an option uh, uh, to go back instead of re-signing with the Hawks. Tyrone uh, Woods. Yep. Uh, had an offer. Right. Uh, Scott. Atchison. Scott Atchison uh, with the uh, Giants. Scott. Uh, mm -hmm. Matheson. Matheson, you know, was had a mm -hmm. had a deal with the Phillies and the Giants said, whoa, <laughs> no way we're keeping you here. So mm -hmm. those things happen. But there's that there's that push and pull now that really did not exist um, 15 years ago. Where it's a uh, there's an equilibrium. People are are eager to go back. It's hard to keep guys. I mean, I'm sure the Swallows would have loved to have Scott McGuff, you know, forever. But it just yeah. wasn't going to happen. The, the options just were not going to. They weren't going to be able to match money or opportunity. You know, the chance to to play an MLB back home is 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 also very appealing for guys who hadn't had success there before. All right, uh, let's make a two-seam transition now. Talk about amateur uh, player procurement. Uh, and I always say I don't feel a draft when we talk about the MPB draft because <laughs> it's just weird. It's Jim and I have debated this. We've talked about it on the show throughout the decade plus. We've had a podcast, and I laughed at it. I scoffed at it, and I just I absolutely frustrated watching it. And uh, it might be a speak for yourself situation in this case with Jim, but the rules are, I think, intentionally convoluted. And while some might argue it's to limit players, is what Jim has told us in the past, is to limit the rights of players. That's why they're drafted. Uh, I, I always look at the pool of players and think, okay, this is how some of these lower budget teams or smaller market teams can improve. Why don't we give them the first picks or even pick in order of finish or however you want to do it to improve the teams that give them a marquee player or potential marquee player or give them the option to choose an op a player who has a name as opposed to playing choosing a Munetaka Murakami who really didn't have a lot of fame when he was in high school and was not one of those big, huge names out there. Anyway, Trey, you can tell us about what goes on in preparation for the MPB draft because you were with the fighters and you had to pick up new players and I know you earlier stated that when you're talking about free agents you had some input but how much input did you have and what insights to this draft process can you share with us today well it's it's a great question um I'll tell you that it was limited but I was thankful that they brought me into the fold and it was the second year so it was 2004 um, I was really, really specific. I've never utilized agency for signing my deals. 
So the first question that I'd at, that I asked was what exactly you guys came after me. I was perfectly mm -hmm. happy. I was minor league director and field coordinator for the Texas Rangers, Texas Rangers during my negotiation. And I had already finished my negotiation with Japan. And this is like, there are like 10 people that know the story and I'll keep it short. But when, when I signed my deal, they had prepared for Jerry Naren to be their manager in 2003. They went on West Coast Swing. I'm in Arizona, the first ever camp held in Surprise on the Texas Rangers side, running instructional ball. They fly me into Dallas, and I have a pseudo interview with John Hart and Tom Hicks. At the end of the eight-hour interview, uh, they said, we want you as our manager. How do we get you out of going to Japan? And I said, well, Mr. Hicks, with all respect, sir, you're a shrewd businessman. Uh, I'm a handshake guy. I told Japan I was going to do something. I'm principled. I'm going to do it unless they give me their blessing that I can stay and be the manager for my hometown team where I grew up two and a half miles from your ballpark. Mm. Fast forward. They wouldn't let me out of the deal in Japan. It was a blessing from God. I was very specific and asked, what do you want me for? Am I coming over to be the mascot, shake hands, sign autographs, kiss babies? What do you want? They said, we want you to develop a championship caliber, sustainable system throughout the organization, major league, minor league. We want you involved and we'll work through that as you get over there. But you have total control of the major league roster and what happens on the major league field. And I said, well, what about the minor leagues? I said, there are certain things that I cover, team defenses, hitting philosophy, pitching philosophy. There are certain things that I need impactfulness in with our development. Fast forward, second year, I'm playing well with others, so to speak, in the Japanese culture, although made many, many mistakes. And they said, okay, hey, will you talk to our scouts? When I talked to our scouts, uh, both Danny and Aaron can, I, I think, appreciate this. I simply started with, we've got to change our roster. And we mm -hmm. lined up six teams in the Pacific League. We went position by position on a grease board in my office in the Tokyo Dome at the end of the season. There's a reason why this team has not been to the playoffs since 1973. Let's analyze this. We had two players on our roster that were in the top three of the six. Augusta War was one, and I can't remember the other. It might have been Connie Mira that was a top three starter or something like that. Mm -hmm. Else was not on the chart. So in 2004, they started having me talk to the scouts and help educate the scouts of what we were looking for. And uh, good to see you back, Aaron. <laughs> and, um, it That was the start of me getting more involved with what our roster needed to accentuate our opportunity to move up from fifth and sixth place historically to the eighth class of being one through three. Um, so on my, my standpoint, it wasn't who to go get. It was what we needed to go get and how to evaluate what was going to be procurement for uh, the draft to help us the quickest at the major league level. So names, I, I didn't even try to act like I was smart enough to say. I I would see video every now and then, but, you know, that's where the trust factor came in. They told me we had good scouts. I got to meet with the scouts 2004, 2005, 2006 during spring camp in Okinawa, and I would do presentations and examples of evaluation of skill 
sets. And then I would break down our roster and say, this guy's on his way out. Uh, and, you know, those, those were very difficult dis- discussions, Johnny, because it, um, we all know the loyalty factor that plays sure. into some of the veteran teams. But you go from 2003, my first year when we were still in Tokyo, to 2007, my last year, or 2006 when we won the championship. And we had turned our roster over by something like 70 to 73% or something like that. We had to get better players. So I really commend our scouts. But I I didn't have great control on who. Philosophically, I tried to educate what we needed to uh, actually win in competition against the other five teams in our in our league. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Aaron, what did you hey, observe? John? Yes, Dan. I'm sorry. No, go no, ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, go Aaron, you go and then I'll jump in. No, go ahead. Go ahead. You got something to say. I I I know what I want to ask Aaron. Go ahead, please. Well, I was just going to say there is no greater thing in baseball in my career than attending Koshien. It is an absolute spectacular situation. I saw Matsuzaka and I couldn't believe what I saw. It was unbelievable. And it's a it's a baseball cultural experience. Now I can tell a story that I couldn't tell before. Um, I saw a ton of amateur players during my travels to Japan. You guys would see me at two in the afternoon, but earlier in the day, I was going to high school and college workouts, and I was going to see players in between games because I always wanted to find a guy who wanted to bypass the Japanese draft and wanted to come play in the States. Um, that Otani guy, you know, I saw him as a senior in high school and just drooled and couldn't <laughs> believe the skill set. Um, so for me, the amateur game in Japan is played at an elite level. The big six is as good as any conference in the, in the United States. Um, the great high school teams would be great anywhere in the world. I mean, I'd, I'd put any of the elite Japanese high school programs up against, you know, up against a uh, Southern California high school team and they'd compete like crazy. The problem is most kids don't want to come over. So as a result, you know, there's some great scouts in Japan at the amateur side. The fighters have a phenomenal scouting director in Endo Sun, the former left-handed pitcher, he's phenomenal, just a great scout. And uh, I just think part of the problem is a minimalized number of rounds and, uh, you know, the lack of a minor league system for the most part. You know, teams have one team for the most part, so there's not as much opportunity. But I will say that for me, you know, the most glorious part of Japanese baseball is the stranglehold in August that everybody has watching these young men become national stars before they've ever played a game in college or at the pro ranks. And it's so unique and so extraordinary. And you learn so much about them at a young age as a result. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I'm, I want to interject too, but I want to, I want Aaron to finish. So Aaron, I'm just wondering because I had talked to players before who are in the midst of playing here in Japan, import guys. And they said, look, I know we need X and, and Y and Z on our team. Those are, those are issues that we have, but our team doesn't even have player X, Y, or Z on our, on the draft board. They're not even talking about him because he's in bed with another team. What did you observe or what insight can you give us in terms of the draft process when you were a player and what you've observed as a scout? Well, truthfully, my my knowledge on that is much more limited than Ben and Trey's. But I will say that as the draft would come along, um, I played with Aoki and you know some other um, 
players that would include us in conversations and they would talk about the dimension, some of the heroes of Koshin and who they were. And we could envision these players joining us and yet drafts would come and they just weren't there. So we would hear stories about, well, this guy's going to the giants because he went to high school with such and such a person. And there were so many factors that I just failed to understand. And we would get so frustrated because maybe we lacked a starting power, a starting, you know, front end uh, starting pitcher, and there would be one available. And yet we would draft a 130 pound second baseman on our first round. And it, so we were just kind of like wondering what it, for us foreigners, we would sit and scratch your head because it, we just had a hard time wrapping our head around where we actually are, um, where our focus was on those players. You know, like I, but I would say that to touch on a point, one thing that I think could drastically improve that and and Dan's point is expanding the minor leagues. Um, we had a we had one minor league system, one one minor league team. I know some other teams have two. We had one, and the quality of there there was such a steep decline from the Ichigoon team to the Nigoon team. We would go down there and watch these players. And we just had a hard time looking at that. Let's say we were going on an off day or we were injured. We would watch these players and say, how can any of these guys jump in there tomorrow if, if we had an injury and really help us? So I think, um, I don't know. I still don't know the answer, but I think they would benefit by having a multi-tiered system the way they do in the States. And I think that you would see that quality um, improve significantly. Jim. Yeah. A couple things. Uh, yeah. The draft is, is what it is. And I have had players echo the same, uh, sentiments. Uh, I can, I can't say because he's working for the team he used to criticize as a player. So I, I won't say who said it, but, uh, <laughs> you said basically our draft priorities are, are all wrong. Um, are some one of the things in Japan and one of the the teams you know they don't exist they exist in a Japanese context and it's really hard to take them out of that you know it's I I, I agree with you the depth is is the big issue uh, but above that there's also this context of Japanese teams uh, five five of the 12 teams don't own their own stadiums or don't have operating licenses to own their own stadiums and they have it pretty much costs them um it costs them money to play home games which is why the fighters used to play so many games at Tokyo Dome because it was j- it they could they could make more money playing games at Tokyo Dome than they could at Sapporo Dome yep. uh, and so that's hits to one thing is that uh, the swallows, the dragons, the giants to some degree. Well, the giants are pay you, you know, Tokyo Dome doesn't do them any favors. Uh, no. And the giants, the dragons, uh, the the tie, uh, excuse me, the giants, the dragons, and the swallows are are pretty much the only teams left that have zero ownership rights in their ballparks. And for them, the idea of spending of losing money at their at for every home game. And then spending more money on a third team is just incomprehensible, you know. But so that that context, the teams are are there for what they're there for, and it's not really to to develop baseball uh, from the from the parent company's uh, position. So that is going to, I think that's going to change because that's that's going to change because the Pacific League is changing it with the fighters moving into their new park. They're going to be making tons of money, and they're the last Pacific League team that doesn't have an operating license uh, to run its own park and profit off of its own games. Uh, Buffaloes own their stadium. The Hawks own their stadium. The Lions own their stadium for what it's worth, even though nobody wants to play there. Uh, The Eagles have an operating license. The Marines have an operating license. And apparently they're going to build a new park next door to their old one and put uh, Chief Mm -hmm. Marine Stadium out of business. So uh, the Pacific League teams, when they're all making money from their parks, the Central League teams are going to say, eventually, 10 years down the road, are going to say, okay, we've got to get rid of this agreement. And as much as I love Mm -hmm. Jingu Stadium and how historic it is, the swallows are going to have to join that that bandwagon, and and if they want to stay in the game, so 
so I think there's that. Yeah, the 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 the, the depth is a thing, and also the other thing with the the draft priorities. The last thing I'll say is the other part of that context is that these teams are heavily involved in in Japan's hierarchical uh, senpai, kohai, seniors, and you know you're, you're the people who came before you in the organization, and that is a huge. Dr- I don't want to, you know, it's, it's a great support. It means you can get support. You have these huge support networks all over Japan, but on the mm-hmm. other hand, it means you're getting input from a million guys who really have no business giving you input. And <laughs> it's the, it's worst, the worst with Hanshin and, and Yomiuri that they can't, the giants can't go to a, a, a college kid and say, here's your, your strength training workout. Because the old guys would throw a fit and there'd be newspaper stories the next day about how the Giants are ruining baseball. The Tigers, same thing. It's why Fujinami's a string bean, because the Tigers couldn't go to him and say, this is how you properly weight train. Because the old guys would, the next day would be the Tigers are ruining baseball and they can't deal with it. So it's why, you know, this, that player said, Look, we're drafting, um, we're drafting five foot four pitchers who throw, you know, eighty mile, great eighty mile an hour, uh, you know, whose changeup, whose fastball is a changeup, but he can pinpoint it, and he's got great baseball instincts. So that's the guy who's going to win us a pennant. <laughs> and uh, pretty much that was the thing. And strength training, he would, he just, you know, he'd laugh. He said, our strength tra- training coach is a former player who, you know, doesn't know anything. To to paraphrase, he was he was probably more pejorative than that. Well, I, I want to get back and double back to something that Trey said. And geez, there was so much good information there, Dan. I loved what you said as well. And and Aaron, appreciate what you had to say. Um, I was just wondering, Trey, you said you had some import, the input, it was limited. You're the manager and you want to install or instill some kind of philosophy uh, in terms of roster building. And can you give us a percentage of the input that maybe you were able to to impart on the team? I'm just wondering because it would seem like if you're the manager and you're going to be out there pulling the strings for these players that you would have a, a, a strong input in what kind of players to uh, acquire and what kind of roster you want to build in terms of the kind of baseball you're going to end up playing. Yeah. Or was it a more long term? What is a more long term look when the draft? Because I, I know you talk about drafting young baseball players, and not many can come in immediately and be a, a Kazuyoshi Tatsunami and a, a Masahiro Tanaka and start playing. You know, day one after graduating from high school. Yeah, if I had to put a percentage on it, Johnny, I would say it was between 70 and 80% from year two through five, uh, mm. at least philosophically for what we needed and why we needed it. And we would do that simple exercise of, okay, here's declining, here's declining in production. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with age and uh and I was very transparent. I was always tried to be exceptionally um, respectful with my presentations, but uh, I would tell the truth and say, it's great that you guys are so loyal, but your loyalty is crushing the organization. I I mean, I, I went to the nth degree being a former major league clubhouse guy while I was playing baseball at the University of Texas at Arlington. And I was a clubby for two years, and I'm proud of that. <clears throat> I used to wash jocks and and towels and vacuum and clean up the clubhouse at Arlington Stadium. But that all led me to being very transparent with my future employee of the fighters and saying, hey, this is where our deficiencies are, and this is why. And we need this, and this will compete with the other five better. And then I would go to the next piece. So I I remember when we got Yagi. Um, Tomoya, Tomoya, the left-handed pitcher. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, he was a flash in the pan for the most part. Didn't last very long, uh, but he helped us win a championship. Uh, and I, I remember prior to the draft uh, that year, I said, we need a starting pitcher. We've got, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this, we've got this. Of course, we had Darvish was our number one at the tender age of 20, uh, eight, 18, 19, 20 years old. Uh, he was a man child, but we needed something to complement. And I was hopeful that it would be left-handed. I said that, uh, and we got Yagi. And uh, so I would say year two through five, I would say 70 to 80% influential with what type at what position to fund our roster in the proper way. And then, you know, I, I commend our scouts because, and th there was a lot of just simplicity, Western scouting intellect that, uh, well, first of all, when I, a lot of people don't know this, but when I stopped playing at the age of 25, my choice, I was offered a scouting position. That's why I stopped. Um, I might, if everything aligned, I might have got a cup of coffee. Maybe. I've had multiple – I played for five guys in three seasons. Two of my favorites were Eddie Bain and uh, and Mike Hargrove. I sought wise counsel, what the good book tells us to do, seek mm -hmm. wise counsel. When I was offered the scouting position, they both said exactly the same thing. One was in Arizona, one was in Florida. Called both of them, said, hey, I'm being offered this scouting job. Should I take it? Both said the same thing, exactly what I just said. You might get a cup of coffee. Well, I was a scout first. So I learned scouting principles. I learned how to evaluate players. I was with two guys with the same name, Don Williams and Donnie Williams, both renowned scouts here in the United States. God bless them both. Uh, and they took me under their wing and they taught me things. Well, I passed those on and I was, I wasn't flabbergasted, but I was shocked that the scouting uh, knowledge and the basis that they utilized at that time that I was there was as limited as it was. So hopefully I gave them uh, some pieces of new skill sets that helped better fund our roster and then we had the thing that we still have in japan and that's how do you assimilate a 34 or 36 year old veteran guy that's waiting in the wings that is not on your major league roster and he's playing with 18 year olds so, <laughs> i mean that, that's a whole we could do a whole podcast on that in itself. So yeah, I'm sure we could. Uh, Dan, I saw you shaking your head a lot during Trey's remarks there, but I'm thinking when you're when you're a general manager and you're looking at the field manager and you're looking at the roster and there's so many factors to to consider when you're in the off season building. How do you just go about compacting all that information into uh, selecting players? John, it's a great question. For me, the biggest mistake personnel guys make is they build a club that they would manage instead of furnish the manager with a team he can win with. Um, when you yeah, make they're... a decision to hire, you, well, you know, Trey, when you hire a manager, you hire his gamesmanship. You hire his in-game knowledge. You, you inherit his gut. And he inherited his strategy and his philosophy. Mm. So, John, to fully answer your question, you know, it doesn't it doesn't matter that I don't like a third catcher. If Trey wants a third catcher, I'm going to give Trey every chance to succeed. And if he wants three lefties in the pen, and wants a third catcher, and wants to platoon, um, I'm going to give him every opportunity. And when he fails, I can say to Trey, hey, I gave you the opportunity. You manage a team the way that you wanted to with your personnel from guys 20 to 26. It didn't work. We're going to go another way. And Trey walks away and says he's right. He did. What I find fault is there's some egotistical 
GMs in the major league game that have the audacity to make out the lineup for the manager that tell the manager what to do from a personnel standpoint. And I think the, the really crappy part about it is then they fire the manager and rip the manager for a team that they put together for their own well-being. And I think the really good GMs say to the manager, what do you want? What do you want that 26 guy to do? What do you want your long man to look like? Do you carry six infielders or six outfielders? What does your club look like? And I'm going to give you what I, I've decided you're the guy. And as a result, I'm going to give you the tools to win with. The problem, John, is egos get in the way and they get in the way in Japan and they get in the way in every part of the world where some personnel guys can't get the heck out of the way and they put a team together that they'd like to have instead of forgetting that they're not wearing the uniform and they're not making out the lineup card. And shame on them because they hide behind the manager instead of having the guts to let the manager manage the coaches coach, the players play. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Aaron, uh, what has been your experience when you're on a team and you, like you said, you went down to the minors, uh, doubling back again to what you talked about. You would go down to minors uh, because you were injured or whatever happened, and you saw the state of the union, so to speak, of the, of the farm team thinking, well, these guys are not this guy and this guy and this guy are not replacement level. We can't bring them up and expect them to function with us uh, at this talent level. What, what what did you feel? What was your experience when you saw that? Well, it's it, it's tough because you you get torn between caring and having an opinion and wanting some to input or have to put your opinion out there for people that are listening. On the other hand, the the helplessness knowing that you're not really going to make much of a difference so there was a few times i would go down and just not see personnel and a lot of times when i was with the swallows we were struggling so there was that frustration was was very high and it was shared by my japanese teammates we used to have discussions there we'd we'd sit in the, the training room or weight room or go out to dinner after and that that was that was shared but a lot of time like the japanese expression what shogunai like it's it is what, what it is yeah, what can you do? And you know, I all when I when I ended up retiring and leaving Japan, I was thirty nine years old. So my my brain was shifting more towards Dan and, and Trey the way that they think as executives, and you know, like a, a a different way of thinking. That's where my brain was going. And I I often would daydream about you know what happens if I had an opportunity to coach or be part of that. I would do things quite a bit different. And I know it's easier said than done because you have to deal in states or Japan. You're dealing with it's not just your team and your your money and your draft board. You have so many other factors to consider. But I didn't think that I would overcomplicate it. But in our mind, when we were talking, we just we we, we would make decisions that were much different from from what I saw. And, and I can understand the Japanese guys never got frustrated. They never vented to us. But they, in quiet um, uh, situations they would always let us know hey we don't like this but there's really nothing that we can do but you would also see the powerhouse teams with the money end up with with a lot of the players or they'd get lucky like we did with murakami it was that was a that was a really good draft but um you know it's something that i i hope changes because as a player or as an executive you know you watch a draft and and you, i love the swallows i would always just want hey get us the best player get us the player i don't care if we have a need, great. And there's options, great. But otherwise, just get us the best player. And I, I just didn't see that very often. Jim, anything to add? Well, I mean, you're thinking about Murakami. And, of course, the guy I think about who is a similar, you know, Murakami was not their first choice. And uh, That's right. I think about Tetsuto Yamada. And Tetsuto Yamada wasn't their first choice. He wasn't their second choice. The first, right. <laughs> The first choice was was the uh, epitome of, you know, he, he's got great baseball instincts guy, Yuki Saito, the, the handkerchief prince. Oh. 
They, so they, they missed on Yuki Saito and then they missed on uh, Shio, uh, Shio's, what's uh, Shio, Shiomi, the pitcher with the Eagles. Right. Lefty. And they, they mm-hmm. lost out on him. And then they got uh, they got Yamada as the consolation prize. Well, that's a heck of a consolation prize. Yeah, yeah. and that's how it works. That happens out a, a lot. lot. It does yeah. happen a lot. All right, uh, one more topic, and then I'll let you guys uh, get out of here. Thank you very much for sticking with us here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, look at assessing the assets, and this comes from me. I, I always sit around thinking about what separates teams. Um, you know, makes one team a lot better than the other team. And it's not always talent. And so I came up with these three aspects. And one is a player who's an absolute talent. It really doesn't matter uh, the team or the situation. This player is going to have success at some level. And then there's what I would call a fituation. And that's fit and situation together called a fituation. So this is a player who can thrive in multiple environments and various strategies and situation, but he needs a strong environment. He needs a coach to coach him. He needs uh, trainers to make him work harder to get more fit so that he can stay healthy. And he needs good teammates around him so that he can, you know, he's not having to bear all the responsibility, but he can produce. He's a really good player. And then there's the situationship, which is a situation and uh, a relationship merged together. And that's a player who Basically, because of contracts and maybe budget budget constraints or whatever circumstances, this could be an aging player who's maybe in decline. It can be a player you pick up as a free agent. And uh, so you've spent a lot of money on him. And now you you see some 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 issues uh, in his play that need to be, let's say, covered by the rest of the team. But uh, because of these situation that you've acquired this player, uh, the manager has to use him. The player has to play. And so you have to figure out, you have to work together to figure out how to make this situation work. So a situation ship. Um, I'm not sure how close I am. This is things that I, these are things that I've observed in other sports, uh, particularly basketball and football, where sometimes a player is uh, moved to another team and he just doesn't produce. And everyone says, well, this guy, this was a bad move. Uh, this this player was done and, and this team picked him up. And, and I'm like, no, the the situation that this player was in before was completely different from what this player is in now. And now he's being asked to do more and he just wasn't that player. He was never that player, but that the environment and the situation fit him with the previous team. And so that allowed him to produce. I don't know how close I am. How do, how close do you think I am to the truth, Dan? You know, John, I think the most dangerous word in baseball is expectations. I think you put expectations on people that can't be met, or if they are met, it's a fluke. And then everybody's disappointed. Um, I think truth serum is so lacking in most major league organizations. For that matter, I I think travel teams even, even suffer from it. Um, I think you nailed it. I think one of the problems we have as a game is being unrealistic about who the guy is. Who's he going to be in 2023? Not who you want him to be, but it's like walking into, you know, a restaurant in Nomota Sando and, you know, expecting to get, you know, Okonomiyoki, you're not going to get it. You're there for dumplings. <laughs> you're there for yakisoba and don't expect something you're not going to get. And I think in the game, we have so many teams that struggle with process that have flawed processes led by people who are arrogant and think they know the game better than anybody else As a result, they're not collaborative. They don't listen to people in the room. And those teams can never figure out why they don't have extended um, winning. You know, there's a reason why the Hawks win. The Hawks win because they have a phenomenal front office. Yeah, they've got money, but they're just like the Dodgers. They produce young players. They scout like crazy. But they also have a really high 
expectation level and they need it more often than not. So I think one of the problems in Japan is prevalent in the States and that is flawed process. You know, you think you can do it a certain way and succeed every year. Well, the really great personnel guys adapt to their club. You know, maybe they're pitching in defense for a six year period and then they're pitching ages and they got to be offensive. Some people can't adapt. Some organizations can't change on the fly. Um, you take a look at the Braves in 2021. You know, at the deadline, they were 500 club. Right. And they have a brilliant general manager and he turned the team around. There are great personnel guys in Japan that adapt. And like anywhere else, there are others that don't. And I think the ones that are able to manipulate, change, listen to their people. You know, for me, one of the great mentors in my life said, being a great personnel guy is merely seeing the truth before everybody else mm -hmm. and recognizing this guy's better than I thought, or this guy's a bust. We better move him and get rid of him before everybody else figures him out. And I think the Japanese teams suffer from the same um, illness that the North American teams do. And that is some just simply, they, they just can't think outside their rigid standards. They set expectations. I mean, John, when you draft a guy first, it doesn't mean he's going to be a good player. It just means you drafted him first. first. You know, I think of Kiyomiya and the talk of Japan five years ago. I saw him play five or six games that year. And I kept watching him going, I'm not so sure about this guy. The expectations on that kid were so high. Just imagine being him at 19 years of age and the pressure that kid had. You know, he's got a, he's got a, a family of athletes. The expectations were unrealistic from the start. That kid could have never succeeded out of the gate. And that's a hard thing to do to any athlete. Excellent, excellent points. Uh, Trey? I can't say it any better than Danny just said it. Uh, I really can't. I mean, it, I think the expectations are uh, unrealistic in, in so many aspects, uh, especially when it aligns with bloodlines. I've played out in the United States many, many times. I've seen it happen on the positive but those are much more rare uh, just because of the philosophy of the horse race bloodline thing uh, coming from winners and athleticism than I have uh, seen it with the failure side of guys that don't make it out of a ball because they were uh, a former major league uh, player's son or nephew or – grandson um good lord especially for the 13 years that i was with the new york yankees we didn't know who was going to show up in tampa and mr steinbrenner was going to put in a uniform for spring training um so <laughs> it's uh I, I think danny nailed it I, I really i really can't add to what danny just said uh aaron what do you think about my breakdown of uh the the fits for players and teams Oh, I think I thought it was great, but also listen to Danny break that down. Uh, as I was listening, I I understood the premise of what he was talking about, and then just to see it below the surface and understand it, um, I thought it was very cool to see that because I'm a, still a player, still in my heart, and I haven't been part of some of those processes that you know Trey or Dan has done that. So for me, it was just cool to listen to that take to really see behind the curtain a lot more. So it's. It's like that was uh, that was that was fun to listen to, Jim. Well, I feel like I'm I'm still in Dan's class <laughs> uh, from a couple of years ago because I'm getting schooled again. Uh, I, I again nailed it the the whole bit about expectations, and I 
I think one of the things, and, and as you were talking, I wasn't necessarily thinking about the Hawks, but I was thinking about other teams, and I'm thinking about the Swallows. It's really, I think, one of their really real strengths is give guys a chance to fail and and you know see where see where they are instead of throwing them. You know, this is the guy is going to be our next star. Even even with Okugawa, who was their uh, you know, who they scooped up in the draft lottery. You know, they didn't like throw him. He wasn't on the first team. Well, he was hurt, so he wasn't on the first team on opening day, but they gave him time to, to get well. Uh, well, well enough to, to need Tommy John surgery, but that's another story. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, when you said it, when you talked about teams having expectations, one of the two, the, I guess my only two comments is one is first I thought, man, that is the old Oryx Buffaloes um, before Hasegawa uh, took over. Or, well, he, he didn't take over, but he started informing them, and I think they started listening to him. They cleaned out some of the uh, riffraff who were occupying the front office. And one of my favorite words, Jim, riffraff. <laughs> okay. That is a great word. <laughs> so yeah, um, to be kind, I think, and in, in those individuals' case. But yeah, expectations. And they had the Buffaloes had that history of giving up on players who were good and not get, you know, and, and placing high expectations or even sometimes low expectations. But the other the other Part of that, you know, and Trey alluded to earlier, is the loyalty issue. Japanese teams are, you know, they pretty much feel stuck with their players. As Trey said, Mm -hmm. you know, we've got these guys and they're on the team. And we got to we got to play them a couple of games a year because we've been marketing them. You know, they're the (laughs) they're the they're the guys we've been calling our guys for year after year. They can't. And the other aspect is, uh, in Japanese baseball, it's very hard to have a trade because the worst thing that can happen is you make a mistake. It doesn't matter how much you succeed. If you give away a player that nobody thinks is any good and he succeeds with another team, then you're probably going to lose your job because the fans are going to be angry and the whole crowd of former players are going to say, well, you blew it. You know, you made us look bad, and looking bad is not a good. You know, it doesn't doesn't fly in Japan. Awesome. Well, I always talk about uh, you know the fact that losing is learning. I also talk about the fact that we take snapshots of our players. That if someone sees a player hit a home run in a certain situation, that that guy is a home run hitter, or that's the expectation. And when we see them fail that that's the player can't play defense or can't hit or whatever. And they're all just snapshots and we have to be careful of that. And I often talk about uh, the fact that it's well, this culture thing that we talk about the culture of, of winning and losing. I think that the players think it's them, the coaches and managers think it's them. The trainers say, Hey, we, you guys wouldn't be anything if we didn't get these players back out on the field and keep them healthy. Uh, the bench players think, well, uh, you know, I make that guy better because I challenge him every day in practice and I make him better. He makes me better. They think it's them. The front office people and the secretaries, they all think, well, you know, none of this would be successful if we weren't keeping the paperwork, you know, chugging along. And the the, the thing is, it's everybody. It takes everybody. And I learned that in 2006 when I talked to Trey Hillman and he told me we need everybody on the in the not maybe on the same page but we definitely need them in the same book we definitely need them in the same chapter we need everybody pulling the same direction and mm-hmm. uh that was one of the lessons Trey that I took away from your time here and the many talks that we had and it's really a shame that we didn't have a podcast back then cuz it would have been super <laughs> awesome but but I have always appreciated the uh the the insights that you guys have given us uh we've done podcast chats uh Dan has been a guest Trey has been a guest. Aaron has been a guest before. Um, but I can't thank you guys enough. I want to get you guys out of here. I can't thank you guys enough for taking the time out of your busy schedules to inform and entertain our audience. Uh, hopefully this will entertain a lot more people than we usually get in terms of listenership and, and we'll get it up on YouTube and have more viewership. Uh, but before we go, I just want to say thanks a million to 
all of you and, and Jim, I know you have a heck of a time getting this video going and edited, but I uh, appreciate your work there as well. Uh, but thank you very much, gentlemen, all of you for the fantastic conversation. Well, John, you were like, yeah, John, you were like Santa Claus thank bringing you. us this present because you were you were you were excited, but I I didn't do any of the hard work. You were pull you were pulling the load. So thank and the, you all. And the, and uh, Aaron, pleasure yeah. meeting you, Danny. Yeah. Great seeing you, Jimmy and Johnny. Great, great to see you guys. It, it's a blessing getting to be a part. Thank you all. And Jim and John, thank you for what you do throughout the year. You're my link to uh, Japanese you. baseball. I follow both of you every day. And you, you're you my eyes and ears over there right now. And I love it. And I I really uh, I respect the two gentlemen that I was on with today. I love them both. They're good guys. And I appreciate you two bringing the five of us together. It was a lot of fun tonight. It's always good in mid-January to be talking about that five-ounce little baseball. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a really good option. Amen. Hey, everybody needs to know uh, Mr. Evans has got a uh, birthday coming up two weeks from today. <laughs> Happy birthday, buddy. You're not going to be as old as I am. As so as you, know, <laughs> you know, it's better to be – it's better to be – uh, adding to birthdays, and it's better to be seen than viewed. So I'm very happy. Yeah. Thank you all. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much for a super conversation. We'll see you next time. Take care, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. God bless you.